Yeah, I'm very happy to talk to you about uh, the internet computer and, and how the internet computer can be used to also, uh, you know, code Bitcoin and how it extends the Bitcoin network. Um, right. So the, the agenda here is like first I would want to like tell you more about the internet computer, what the internet computer is, why, why it's like different from many other uh, blockchain networks. Then a bit about smart contracts on the internet computer, how these work, uh, how, how it's different. Uh, then like talk about Bitcoin and the internet computer, how, how these two interact and how this all works. Briefly discuss a few example dApps that are running on the internet computer that already use Bitcoin. And uh, right at the end, there's some, some links uh, for further resources. And please stop me. I guess we're about 30, like 60 people. Did, did you take questions at the end of the day or, or are people supposed to stop me and discuss in the meantime? Uh, what, what's the uh, users here? Yeah, we can, we can stop about five minutes to the hour and do questions. Okay, good. Right, and let, let's dig in. So, I mean, firstly, the, the, I mean, I, I'm a CTO at the Definity Foundation. So Definity Foundation sort of emerged from the early Ethereum community, like when the Ethereum community uh, sort of discussed uh, this whole, essentially like, you know, like, the Ethereum community sort of emerged from the Bitcoin community when the Bitcoin community was, uh, the Ethereum community was thinking like about world computer, like adding compute uh, to a blockchain, whereas Bitcoin is like the digital gold kind of thing. And then Definity came out of this idea, like let's build a, a world computer. And I mean, sort of had like, uh, I guess our founder, Don Williams, so he was involved in, in these discussions and uh, quickly realizing, well, actually, if you want to really turn Ethereum into a computer, you need to do it quite differently. And so that, that led to the Definity Foundation with the goal to actually build this uh, world computer. Like I, I started like five, yeah, more than five years ago uh, with Definity because I was attracted to the, this vision. I previously was at IBM research and very, very like back in 2000 had like consensus protocols running like a distributed computer running like that and to me it was crystal clear we can totally do that and and so i was very happy to join that like then like all of my friends joined as well which was like uh, really great so we ran and we we're probably having the largest team of cryptographer overall not only in the, in the crypto industry but i guess overall in, in the world like working together on this we also have top engineers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, engineers from Google, IBM, Facebook, Apple. So it, it's a really cool team. I guess not so many people know about it, but it's like a top-notch team. Um, and that team then came together and uh, you know like started uh, to build the, the, inter the internet computer, this world computer, and launched it back in uh, like two years ago, 2011, May 10. And the network has been up and running ever since. There was not a single time when the uh, like the token network, the domain network, was down. I mean, there are some, some like smart contracts that were like like broken once in a while, like applications. But the domain network was never ever down, which is uh, probably like a unique feature in the whole uh, whole industry that never happened elsewhere. Yeah, let's dive in here. Okay, now here we are. So, you know, like I think the internet computer, that's why it's called the internet, com oops, sorry. The internet computer is really this like culmination of uh, I think the evolution of, of compute, whereas like you always had like private infrastructure then had open networks and it started with like uh, DARPANET, the, the internet, then you had the information superhighway like Microsoft, uh, Oracle, AOL, right? And America Online, maybe people might remember uh, as opposed to the internet, but a totally open network. I mean, always like the open networks are for, were predominant, like one in the end. I mean, most of these things started maybe as a proprietary things or the proprietary things that then did not succeed. And I think right now we're in the stage where like, we have traditional IT, the like cloud services, database, uh, web servers, content distribution systems. Like, also here we're, we're uh, seeing the shift towards like an open network. So. The goal of the of Definity Foundation and uh, I guess the computer really uh, achieves that is 
to add compute to the internet, right? Have like a, an open network that not only can be used to communicate, but can also use to compute. And well, in, in some sense, like um, Ethereum does achieve that, only that, that it, it doesn't scale, right? It, it, it's not uh, fast enough, it's, it's not cheap enough, but like from a, from a principle already, uh, Ethereum does that. And now the inner computer is really a sort of uh, going into this promise that, that the Ethereum like community, community started out with, let's build like a network where the world's compute resources can be hosted in an, an open permissionless distributed dis decentralized fashion. And, and so that's why like we've like at the field foundation we started bu out building the senior computer. There's other uh, things that uh, should I oh sorry um, there's other things, of course, that, that, that you need to top of it. Like the inner computer is really the like network, the, the compute services. But then, of course, there need some things on top of it that actually makes it unbeatable. Like what what, what uh, like the foundation has also built, like internet computer, uh, sort of the internet identity, which just uh, makes it easier for users to interact with the network uh, without uh, having the complex things like MetaMask and so on. I know like Apple sign in, Google sign in, and so on. Uh, again, a decentralized federated identity system. And then last not but, but so, certainly not least is like payment building, like I mean crypto tokens, be it the ICP token or or, or Bitcoin or, or like UCSD and UCST. So it's really like if you want to have like a, an open compute platform, you need to have all of these things. You need to have a compute platform, but also like identity and payment figured out. It's, it's like if you want like Apple, like the Apple App Store kind of model where you have a platform where you can run your, uh, like launch your applications. And then also like all, all the hassles of like uh, dealing with user, uh, like I guess in, in Apple's case, user password and, and all of that and, and payment. Uh, that's already there as an infrastructure, then actually you can really build on uh, like different open internet services, like uh, smart contracts that can talk to each other, like an open borderless world. You can of course also do enterprise applications, like more traditional things. At the end of the day, it's just like, like a compute layer that has sort of all these user problems. It's easy for users to uh, go there, but these user problems solved. So that's uh, like the high level vision here, like uh, what is what, what is needed. Now I want to talk a bit at very high level again, what, what about the intercomputer network. So the intercomputer is created by the intercomputer protocol. It's like, uh, yeah, I guess the, the most advanced uh, cryptographic or network protocol ever designed and certainly ever implemented. Uh, so let, let's talk a bit about that. So the uh, the ICP protocol, the intercomputer protocol, uh, is run on independent nodes. So these independent nodes are uh, provided, run, owned, operated uh, by independent node uh, machines in different data centers worldwide. And maybe the difference is different from classical blockchains where, where some kid runs some node in, in their bedroom. Here, actually, these are professional grade node machines that run in professionally operated data centers that, you know, like server grade machines. One of these machines costs like $30,000 uh, 30, and also have the, the, the bandwidth, the maintenance, and, and so, so on and so forth. I mean, that's the only way if you want to have like a, a performant compute platform, you need to build it on top of uh, like performant uh, machines. Now the protocol uh, combines these uh, nodes, machines into different uh, subnet blockchains. So as you see here, like, I mean, of course, in reality, it's like much more than these four machines that you see here. It's more like 13 to, uh, to 50 machines, depending on, on your, your security requirements here. But also the point is like actually if you do something like Ethereum or Bitcoin where you have like thousands of machines doing all the replicated computation, computation that's actually a waste of resources. Again, it would never scale. It would be too expensive, right? Because if you have to do your computation like, like 4,000 times or, or even many more times, that is going to be too expensive to really be a, an efficient compute platform. So the idea here is that, that you have no providers who are 
you know, like well identified, they're, they're known, they're identified, they also are responsible to operate those services uh, successfully. And if they don't do so, then can they can be held accountable. So here we go, we have this uh, no provider. So actually we promised to operate uh, and uh, well actually uh, agreed uh, on the test to operate those uh, the protocol uh, as it should be. And then together they have like all these different subnets. Now on these subnets, um, here, uh, each subnet runs like smart contracts, like in, in the internet computer terminology is like canister smart contracts. Also because these are really like smart contracts that bound code and state and all of that together. It's, it's like one unit of, of computers, like one, one program and data and so on, like, like one bundle. And that bundle could, could even uh, move around from, from different uh, subnets depending on, on the resource requirements and so on and so forth. So it's like a unique piece of code that we state and all of that. It's like a compute unit if you want. And like together really what, what happens is that like one uh, big serverless uh, autonomous cloud, right? I mean this uh, this uh, smart contest just run there forever cannot stop the, the, the network manager's capacity. If it needs more capacity, more subnets can be added. It's really just like unbound uh, compute uh, network that, that can, can uh, yeah, in our vision, eventually host all of the world's or like, I don't know, 90% of the world uh, computing power. Uh, read, and so this is really like a, a revolution of the blockchain uh, uh, landscape. So we, we started out with Bitcoin, which is really di digital gold. And because now we have like ERC-20 of that, it gets a bit more than, than just that. But I guess it's really like Bitcoin started out as like, like, a, uh, like money. Uh, then you have Ethereum that added some more context to, to it, and now the inner computer is the, the, the third step of evolution here. So that's like a very crypto, uh, like cryptocurrency uh, centric view. If you look from a more computer science centric view, actually, in some sense, the, the, the internet computer is, is just like, uh, you know, like with Bitcoin, people realize that actually having this distributed computer makes a ton of sense, it actually solves problem. Whereas uh, like if you come from the cryptography uh, distributed computing point, if you actually, that community since uh, 30 years already knew that you can solve problems uh, much better, like much securely, much easier in, in a distributed uh, computing platform. So from that point of view, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, okay, let, let's now actually put those computer science uh, research and principles in, into practice because now finally the world realizes that this decentralized distributed system are actually very useful. So depending on, on, on your view, either it's like we, we knew that forever, it's just now having been real. And if you have like the more practitioner point of view, it's actually this uh, uh, sort of evolution of uh, the, the crypto space. Right, so the, this is the, the, the network. Now let, let me spend some time on like this canister code, what, what, what this really do before we go into how uh, this is relevant for, for Bitcoin. The canisters are really like a, a different, like more advanced form of smart contracts. And I guess there, there's this saying like software will eat the world, like everywhere, like most of the things that we do will be software, right? I mean, we have, we've seen that already, right? I mean, uh, like, like uh, 15 years ago, we had all these mobile devices that were special built. Today, it, it's all uh, like iPad or like a Samsung pad and all the rest is done by software. So it's really like uh, hardware is, is gonna be commoditized or like standardized and then you do, do everything with like different software. So the whole world is run by software. Is it a train, like all of that? And so in, in uh, like extension of that, actually I think smart contracts will, will, will eat software because smart contracts are just a much better way of, of doing software. And in particular, I think this kind of smart contracts are I think even the best form of smart contracts because if there's really this unit that can be, be moved around, things are bundled off, uh, they can be composed with each other to, to build big, bigger things. They can be open services that other people can use. They could do like, uh, you know, like something like WhatsApp could be an autonomous service run on, run on the internet that's used by its users. So that's where the like Web3 things comes in as well. So I think that's totally where the world will be going. And we will, you know, like 10 years from now, that's how the world will look. Uh, why smart contracts? I mean, Smart contracts are like just 
tamper proof. They, they, they run there, they can be uh, like inspected, but they don't need any like firewall or security team in order to, to protect them. If you run like deploy code like on, on Amazon on, on a typical machine, you have to all of this, right? You have to uh, have like an ops team, you have to have a firewall team to, to protect that. But smart contracts, because they are running on a blockchain, they're sort of by default built on top of like a secure protocol, right? They're, they're not hardware, they're not an operating system, it's like, like, a, like a cryptographic protocol that makes them secure. Uh, that also makes them unstoppable, right? Like, like the internet itself, like uh, the internet still works because it's so replicated and distributed. If some servers fail or, or if some, uh, you know, some power plant gets blown up, I mean, let's not have that uh, happen, but, you know, it, it would not be a problem. Uh, smart contracts can also be an on, uh, autonomous, right? I mean, they, they, they can be just not being controlled, owned by, by anybody, but just be like an open like service that, that runs and everybody can use them. You see that already on Ethereum, there's a lot of these smart contracts that just pe people use and that are, are not uh, controlled by anybody. Another nice thing of, of uh, smart contracts is the, their tokenization. They can actually hold, process, and, and transmit like value, like just like data. And that actually is also very, very powerful. If, if, if now software can, uh, can pay for things, can be paid for things, just opens so much, so many more applications. Composability is important, right? So if you have smart contracts, you have actually like like same very much in the internet where you have this like mesh services where the different uh, services are, are composed together. Same thing, but here actually the, these are different smart contracts that, that uh, you don't have to fear that somebody changes their APIs like Facebook did with like, like Formula back in the days where they killed like a 2 billion company by just changing some API. So the smart contract that doesn't happen because they're just there, everybody can use them and so on and so forth. Uh, and then borderless, of, of course, it's, uh, this is like a worldwide uh, network. You don't have to uh, worry with, with any like access or geography and so on and so, on and so, on and so forth. Now for kind of like so fast software or like smart contracts on the internet computer, in addition, get, get more properties like than what you get, for instance, on Ethereum. They're they're fast. Like this, really, a, like web suite. You, you can later on maybe try some uh, some of these uh, smart contracts. We have like a, a chat platform running, like you know, like a WhatsApp form running on the internet computer, and that people build where you can actually send Bitcoin to each other in within seconds. Um, it's also very efficient because at the end of the day. Uh, the replication that, that you do in the blockchain for security, uh, you already have like much more uh, replication on in to, today's cloud flat platform. Cloud provider by itself already has like replication for backups, but that, then you have replication in the, in the ISP and so on and so forth. And if you have a blockchain protocol that sort of embraces replication, you end up actually being more efficient than, uh, than today's infrastructure. Also, like smart contracts on, on the computer, you can just scale way easier because they're like, like this bundle of software. And if you have, you need to have more of them, you just, you know, they, they can replicate themselves. They can add more. It's all automatic and the protocol just takes care of all of that. Whereas in traditional systems, you always have to worry about, about scaling. Uh, on, on the internet computer, like the, these uh, smart contracts are way cheaper to run than on, on Ethereum or, or so on and so forth. It's really, like uh, much more like traditional software, like the, the cost model is much more like, like you would do on Amazon. Also here, smart contracts have like much more power. So, so for instance, like on Ethereum, a, uh, a Solidity contract has like 4K of, of memory, whereas on the internet computer, it's like 64 gigabyte of memory. So it's like a whole different uh, um, ball game here. Also, because the uh, internet computer interacts natively with, with the Bitcoin network, but also with, it gets being worked on uh, for to do that with other blockchains like Ethereum and, and, and so, so more. So you actually can also like to interact with the world. In fact, you can also interact with the uh, the the like traditional uh, world because smart contracts can actually make HTTP calls to to any server on the internet and can actually be reached via HTTP. They have their own URL. Every smart contract has a URL that can enter in your browser. They can also are searchable by Google because uh, 
so they are going to have the search engine optimization and so on and so forth. It's really much more like a traditional uh, piece of software. Now, somebody raised their hand. You, you want to uh, have a question? Rafa? Hey, Jen. Yeah, uh, actually, it, uh, we can take it for the end if, if, you, if you prefer, but I have a question, yes. Sure, no, let, let, let's take it. I like that. All right, awesome. So I'm working on call options for ordinals. Mm -hmm. And... I'm just discovering ICP. This is really, really intriguing. What you said, very powerful as well. Like smart contract being, being you know, uh, basically maintained on this, this infrastructure that is very performant, that's going to render a UX for my, for my traders out there. They're going to love it. And also you said that the smart contract could be run by a community. Isn't, isn't that what you said? Yeah, exactly. So I'll come to some of that like next, but actually, in fact, we have like a project called Bionic and they're, they're doing like, uh, they just, I mean, it already exists for pieces. I think that they're just uh, in the security review stage now. So the product's called Bionic and they're doing a mar marketplace for ordinals fully on the internet computer. So it's, it's all like on the blockchain. Uh, there's no cloud pieces there whatsoever. And the guy is called Bob Bodily. Uh, like, uh, yeah, the, you'll find his Twitter handle. I have a slide later on as well. And he already does that. So he has like the, uh, like, like a full marketplace. So yeah, I I... He's, he's totally open to talk to people. So I encourage you to reach out to him and uh, yeah, talk to him, like ask him how, how he does it. 100%. I, 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 I'd love to, I, I, I've met Bob and it's, it's amazing. The question is more around, um, the bridging of the asset itself, like okay. the Bitcoin. Yeah, so then let, let me go through this uh, when we talk to this and then we, we can maybe take the question there. If that's okay. Fantastic, thank you. Cool, thanks. Uh, right, I guess you sort of touched on that, like a community can run a code and that's actually a very important part that you can, like, uh, like a DAO can be implemented as a smart contract on the internet computer that then can, can control another piece of, or like another bunch of small complex, uh, these canister uh, pieces of software. So you can have like an end-to-end -end autonomous system, either that, that is self-governed or that actually is governed by a DAO where people get token to vote on that. And in fact, the internet computer itself is like uh, governed by what we, well, what we call the, the network nervous system, which is just like a special application where uh, you know, like where people can stake ICP tokens into like what well, guess what we call neurons. Uh, like it's sort of this matter computer brain, right? And then in the brain you have neurons, but like everybody who stakes ICP has these neurons, and these these neurons they can vote on proposals. So it's like an open and permission less government systems, and the proposals that that are submitted here is. Shall we add like a new machine? Shall we upgrade, upgrade the protocol? Uh, shall we form a new subnet? Uh, shall uh, we whatever, right? Uh, install a new, a new canister code. Uh, and so these uh, proposals are submitted by, by, by neuron holders, by ICP holders. And then, uh, then there's like the like nns.icc0.app is actually the URL of this governance system. And, and so people can then see the, the um, proposals there and then can decide, yes, I want to adopt that or no, I do not uh, want to adopt that. So it's, it's really like, a, like an on-chain governance system that steers the whole into a computer. And in fact, since the, this, uh, like the two first year that the protocol is running, the protocol itself has upgraded itself I guess uh, it's it's now uh, 146 times because <laughs> it happened just like, like uh, I guess yesterday that the protocol upgraded itself. And if you think about it, you know, like the uh, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum took it a couple of years to to fork their the, like upgrade the protocol, whereas on, on the internet computer this happens like, like about uh, two to three times per week. That the, the protocol upgrades itself. So the, the new version of the, the code gets, gets uh, proposed, then it gets uh, accepted, and then all the nodes like automatically get that new version of the software 
stop their operations, when they reach agreement, okay, off the block, whatever, 2,340, they upgrade to the null version, and then the block 3,141 will actually be run, produced with the null version of the protocol. So it's, it's actually a very like liquid democracy system that is implemented already. And so if in some sense, it's, it's like, you know, like it gives full control of a community. It's not only like, like open source where you have GitHub, the code manager there, but actually it sort of gives this to the whole application there itself. So like here depicted, this is like a chat platform uh, where that is controlled by a DAO. So the users of the chat platform they can have whole tokens. And if they think they should, up, should upgrade, uh, their their application, they can vote on that or or they can uh, reject it. So it's a fully autonomous DAO controlled technology. And yeah, so in order to actually everyone can also submit like a proposal here. So if you want, if you have a, like a candidate that DAO wants to become a DAO, it can submit a proposal to to the overall governance system that hey create a DAO for me, and then the, the governance system will say, okay, good, we'll create a token that will, will then control the DAO for this application. And so if it takes like, uh, or creates a whole DAO for that piece of software that then is, uh, runs autonomously. And so this so far has happened like four times. So there's uh, so far four of those DAOs in existence, but then two are in the phase of being created. So there's two open proposals for creating new DAOs uh, just as we speak. So this is like a, like a DAO factory, if you want. And again, that's very, very cool because you can really now have like community owned pieces of software that the community governs and, and can participate in, in doing. And not, not only allows the people to participate, it's, uh, it's also, you know, like you can then, since you have a token, you can say, well, actually, if uh, now somebody wants to help developing here, like uh, for this piece of code, we offer whatever a thousand tokens. Uh, and like, in some sense, you, you can uh, employ everybody via tokens all over the world. You also can do like fundraising, right? Because you do like, like a, uh, a swap for these tokens against, uh, against the, the endowment of, of the DAO. So you can also raise money wherever you are. If you're somewhere in an obscure part of the world, you can raise money from all over the world. So you don't have to be, you know, like in Silicon Valley anymore and you don't have to ha have connections to all, all these, uh, uh, all, all these VCs, right? You can do it from, from all over the world. Actually that, that uh, it happened. So the, a few of those projects uh, raised several, several millions uh, with their DAOs and they have, have like now a DAO that has a, a treasury that they can fund their operations. So it's really like pure Web3, right? So it's like uh, a complete alternative stack to the traditional IT stack where you can really have Web3. And if you think about it, you could not do like a Web3, true Web3 uh, applications if it has some part of Amazon because it, some part that's probably the next slide I don't know, not quite yet but but if you would run something on Amazon somebody has to pay the bill to Amazon it can never ever be decentralized because whoever pays that bill is uh, uh, for for the Amazon services is like, like a, a single point of failure that that can fail and then can shut, shut the whole thing down if it runs on a network this cannot happen. And so it's actually important here that, that uh, now users can connect to smart contracts on the inner computer just with their browser, uh, with their mobile phones, and interact with it over HTTP. And actually, both ways work. Smart con contracts can also like uh, reach out uh, uh, to uh, like services on on the internet. And the one trick here is also like, like users don't have to own any tokens, right? Like if you want to run a, like interact as a smart contract on Ethereum, you have to download MetaMask, you don't have to buy some, some ETH token, otherwise nothing works. And in the computer, it's this reverse gas model where actually the application pay for the computational costs. So as a user, you just enter that URL and you talk with the application already. And that's also very powerful to, to like uh, really go become uh, much more usable, become widespread, such so that everybody has like a very, very, very low barrier to uh, interact with uh, smart contracts, interact with like Web3 dApps. 
Uh, and so the way this happens, like it's and actually it's important that now when you do this over HTTP, you can actually authenticate in both ways. Uh, so from from the user to uh, to the internet computer, uh, this is done via web or them. So like uh, like all the modern devices, they have these TPM chips built in, and these chips can generate uh, public key seek repairs. And so all, all you need to do is, you know, like uh, authenticate to your phone with your fingerprint or your face. It generates those keys, and then it, it authenticates yourself to the internet computer. On the other side, it's as simple as well because the internet computer has like a single uh, forty-eight byte public key, like an EC, uh, like a BLS uh, uh, public key. And whenever you get a message from the internet computer from a smart contract, these, all these messages are signed with that uh, with respect to the public key, and that's all you need to authenticate, right? Uh, if you want to, like for instance, on Ethereum, if you want to know that this message something was really computed from Ethereum, you have to download the full state. If you want to verify it yourself, which is or like uh, hundreds of gigabytes. Uh, so I couldn't do that, you know, with with my watch. On the, on the contrary, for the internet computer, like I can have an application on my watch that uh, can make sure that actually it is secure. It really talks uh, to the blockchain network. A huge uh, deal as well. So it's really just like one master chain key that the the internet computer has, and everybody can really make sure that this is this result is computed securely on uh, by the blockchain network. Right, so uh, let me take a breath here and talk about how a dinner computer can extend uh, the Bitcoin network. So how smart contracts on the internet computer can own and process Bitcoin. Uh, but the first piece here is that like every smart contract on the internet computer can have their own ECDSA public key and can sign with respect to the public key. So they can uh, like sign any transaction and then send that signature somewhere else, be it to some user device, be it to another blockchain, wherever, right? And the way this is, works is like uh, using uh, threshold cryptography. So the secret key corresponding to that public key is secret shared amongst a ton of nodes. And uh, so there is never reconstructed. So it uses state of the art uh, uh, threshold cryptography. And actually, it is the only protocol, only threshold the crypto protocol for ECDSA that's really secure in an asynchronous kind of system. So there's many implementations out there that, that claim to do something like that. Uh, but you know, threshold ECDSA is really very difficult because ECDSA is just like a bad standard. And in order to, to make to have that secure against in an asynchronous system like like the internet, where you have no timing guarantees or whatsoever, is not trivial. And believe me, there's like a ton of papers on like uh, the crypto conferences or Eurocrypt and so on with like uh, the best uh, cryptographer in the world. Nevertheless, those schemes are not secure in an asynchronous system. So the, to my knowledge, the only scheme that actually is secure is the one that, that we have implemented. And as I said, right, we, we have like top notch cryptographers uh, uh, working at, at Definity. And so we, we have uh, put those heads together to really solve the problem to have a secure uh, threshold signature scheme for, for ECDSA that works in production. So th that's done. That's like one of the ingredients. And of course, because Bitcoin has ECDSA public keys, actually now uh, you can have like a Bitcoin address, a smart contract can have a Bitcoin address and can sign Bitcoin transaction. Now, how can you sign Bitcoin transactions? Okay, so, so this is, yeah, so you can only, only sign, sign Bitcoin transactions, of course, you can sign uh, Ethereum transactions or like any other tokens. So smart contracts can now actually own tokens and, and sign like transactions with some tokens and submit them to the other blockchain. So that's like one piece. Was there a question? Okay, then not. Now, of course, uh, you if you want to really interact with, with the, the Bitcoin network, if you want to make that use, there's a second piece that's missing, which is actually, how do you know whether actually you have received Bitcoin, right? Because otherwise you're sitting there, you know that you have five Bitcoin, you, you spend one of them. Uh, but I, I mean, as I'm sure you guys all know, you know in order to uh, receive and send Bitcoin, you really need to have like the latest UTXO sets because that's, uh, how you you process uh, Bitcoin, and to enable that, actually, what what uh, has been done is that now every 
but not every node, but for, 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 for one or two subnets on the inner computer, these subnets also run like a Bitcoin or some, some kind of light client. So the, these, these nodes pull in the latest block from blocks from the uh, Bitcoin network, extract the UTXO sets and then run consensus of, on that old UTXO sets. So now this uh, UTXO set is then provided as an interface to smart contracts like canisters on the inner computer. So now they know, okay, that's the latest UTXO sets. And they, they know that, that this is really like, I mean, it's really what, what's going on here because we have so many nodes that, that talk to all different Bitcoin nodes and they have reached agreement on that. So that's uh, like uh, how they can get these UTXO sets that they know that they receive Bitcoins and with the other feature that they can submit a transaction to the Bitcoin network. So three, two pieces here. Uh, so there's like two system APIs that canisters have. Like one is the Bitcoin API that, that uh, you know, fetches balances, UTXO sets and send transactions. And they can directly communicate with Bitcoin nodes via the, that API. And the second API is this uh, threshold EC, ECDSA signing API that enables canister to, you know, securely hold and use ECDS, ECDSA keys and really sign transactions with that. There was a question like Motari or Seth yeah. Motari. Yeah, Hagman. So we used to work together at IBM. So I, I know who you are. Uh, okay. It's great to meet you. Yeah. Um, so a uh, quick question. Um, the uh, the canister, is it, does it run um, on the Bitcoin node, uh, the full node itself? So when you mentioned Bitcoin API, are you running like oh. RPC calls or? Yeah, so, so actually, so that this, I mean, so again, the, the canister, actually, I should have said that as well. So the canister is really, really like a, a piece of code that's like, it's, it's a Wasm, uh, like web assembly module. And so these canisters run on the computer as a web assembly module, and you can program them in, in, uh, in Rust, in like uh, Motoko, which is like a specialized language that, that, that we designed ourselves to make like decentralized distributed computing easier. You can also use TypeScript, it's a bit more experimental, or actually Python to do that. I would really recommend Rust. But then ROS gets compiled yeah, into WASM right. and the WASM module gets get then uploaded and then this WASM module runs, right? And now for the, for the Bitcoin API, that's, a, that's an API that the, the internet computer platform provides to the smart contracts that they can use to interact with the Bitcoin network, right? But it's really that then the, the, the nodes of the internet computer receive that and submit these transactions to the Bitcoin network and pull blocks and then provide these UTXOs uh, to... Uh, the ICP smart contracts. So, so the creation of the smart contract on your network. So, is that network also use BFT on on the? Because I've been following your project since a long time. I, I know that you run those nodes in the Bitcoin network, but um, the consensus algorithm. So, is it like are you running full nodes or is it different just subnets? I mean. Um, yes, so uh, we, 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 no, the, the, the inner computer itself it runs not a full node. It, it, it sort of runs like, like a light node if you want. Sure. Like a, uh, yeah. Actually, we ended up implementing pretty much a full <laughs> node at the end of the day. Uh, so, I mean, it, it pulls blocks, it verifies them, uh, it, it, it then like, like submits things in, into a memory pool, but it does not do any mining whatsoever, right? Because that would just would, would be too much work. So sure. it's, it's essentially running that's a full node down. minus mining, right? So that's what it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jay? Hi, hi. Uh, I have a specific question about the keys. So we know that smart contract on ICP could have storage uh, ECDSA key and which could be used in Bitcoin as a secret key, right? But yes. uh, is that possible that the physical owners of the server of ICP could actually find out the piece of keys and try to recover the piece for themselves. Say. Yes, yeah, it's a very good question. So it's like threshold cryptography secret sharing, right? So that means the secret key is shared amongst like 40 servers in 40 secure data centers, right? You, you would have to break it into like uh, something like, like whatever, 15 of these servers to extract the keys, right? But so first of all, uh, the node providers actually do not have access uh, to to uh, 
the software itself, right? They, they don't have like SSH access and so on and so forth. So it's really, I mean, they they uh, put up the nodes, they in, install the software, but that software, it's, it's like a hypervisor, but they don't actually have access to, to that anymore. It's like, uh, you know, like you enter CD-ROM and that's all you can do that, that then you, or like it's, it's a memory stick this dish. Uh, and it, it boosts the software, but they don't actually have access to, to those nodes, right? There's no like SHA's access and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, right? I mean, in, in theory, you could go into these data centers, but that's also why, um, you know, these, these guys actually have to write, uh, have to like uh, sign statements that they're actually not doing any, any, any bad shit. And also these data centers are known, they're professionally run data centers. So it's not easy at all to like uh, get to like one of the key shares, right? And if you really want to have <clears throat> the full keys, you would have to have um, many, many of those key shares, right? And then also the 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 key gets uh, like reshared like every few minutes. So if you would want to get the shit, you actually have to get uh, all these shares within that time period as well. That's it's like um, it's it's very hard to, to do that. So, yes, yes. so that's to say it's possible for theory, but actually impractical. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 of course, theoretically, it's totally possible, uh, but I, I don't think it's, it's a practical uh, like, like attack at all. Yeah. It's, it's like, I think it's, it's actually harder than, than, you know, like on, on Bitcoin 51% kind of attack where your miners co collude. Like here, uh, you know, like, of course, again, in theory, people could collude, but, but first of all, they signed the statements, so they would end up in jail. Uh, second, uh, if somebody then would try to do it otherwise, and these are our secured data centers with security cameras and, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. So first thing, we got a lot of tasks, and second, the technology is requirement is super high. Yes. Great, great. Good to know that. That comforts me. Jeff, you had another question? Yeah, yeah, since you guys brought up this point, um, uh, and I'm going to keep it short. So for um, the uh, key distribution and the signing, so are you, because I'm working on the same uh, similar thing, different use case, um, like Feldman uh, uh, dynamic uh, distribution um, or MPC. And, and the other question is I'm considering of using, um, I'm testing with uh, secure computing using enclaves. Um, to, to protect I mean, it, it uses like a version of these Feldman things, but but it's, it's actually much more complex, right? Because uh, also here, like you, you're, I mean, yeah, I guess the, the real answer gets very long, and then, so I mean, you should, you know, like like Victor and other Victor Schoop and others have, have written papers how this really works, uh, you know, uh, because for for threshold ECDSA because ECDSA has this inversion in the exponent section, so some uh, some non-trivial multi-party computation that you need to do. And right. then also because you do this like something that people call pre-signatures. And then right. also you, because the membership could, could change, right? You reshare the keys. You have to be very careful when you reshare, when you change the memberships, because if you do that in, in the wrong... I think it's the notes. Yeah, yeah, but, but because the, the, then actually it, it would not secure. Just like, uh, so like a lot, a lot of the papers that, that you see all elsewhere, they ignore all those issues. And those yeah. issues would, would make actually this protocol insecure if, if you run them in practice, right? So it's like uh, if, if shit hits the fan, uh, there's a lot of a ton of stuff that you have to worry about. And then because uh, and really, that, I think that's one of our advantages uh, uh, we have, like over many other uh, um, pro projects that, that that we have the best cryptographers in the in the world to actually solve these things. Would it be possible to connect the lighter war um, after this? That would be great. Uh, say it again, connect what? Um, I, I, I said, uh, would it be, um, it would be great if we can connect later to basically. Oh, totally. Just, just send me email. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks so much. Uh, Rafa? Yeah. Uh, Jen, I had a quick question about the project uh, that have a DAO. Like you mentioned Bionic. If you could give me like, the you mentioned three DAO proposal. I'd love to have the names and also like, are you selling any of uh, those beautiful uh, artifacts that you have in your gallery? 
right? So the, the, these are actually like some of them are from you know Bionic. They did also the, uh, a marketplace where we can buy NFTs or via ICP. So like uh, some of them are from from uh, like the, the Bionic. They, they did like uh, how was it how was it called? Whatever Bob Bodley did another like NFT platform as well. <laughs> And so that's where I got some from there. That's like some other NFT platforms, my ICP. So, but I'm, I'm not selling them right now. And yeah, I guess, can, can you send me an email as well? Then I'll provide you that information by email. It might be easier. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, what's that? I, ICP Pony. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Jim. Hi. Nice meeting you after a long time. It's very exciting. So just want to know what are the criteria to have an SMS proposal to uh, the crowdfunding stuff, which you have said earlier? Um, well, I mean, I guess, I mean, it's a decentralized network, right? I'm, I'm not the one to, to set up the criteria. I can say a bit the criteria what the foundation takes, uh, you know, to accept the proposal or not. But I mean, some of the proposals right now, we have like a meme coin, like a ghost coin that runs an SNS. And I guess there the foundation abstained because they said, okay, if the community wants to have it, they shall have it. Uh, it, it really depends. But I guess in, in general, you, you want to have a somewhat mature project, right? You want to make sure there, there is no rock pool and then the foundation looks a bit at, at these uh, proposals. And, and uh, if the foundation feels, hey, this is like a rock pool, then actually we, we, uh, the foundation rejects. If the foundation thinks, well, it's something the community might want to have, maybe it abstains. If the foundation thinks, well, that's actually, it wants to participate as well, then, then maybe it accepts. And there, there's like a forum on, on the, uh, the forum, uh, the affinity forums, where like some of that is, is explained. Great. Have you heard of ICP Bunny? I'm from ICP Bunny. <laughs> cool. Yeah, let, let me continue. I guess the the, running a bit out here. Uh, so there's another you. thing actually that, that of course now we can with that as we said like we can have like small contracts that that own uh, Bitcoin and so what was implemented also is like now we have actually uh, like a small contract that owns Bitcoin but now that has like uh, uh, makes a Bitcoin twin like on ICP so that small contract now implements a ledger and with that ledger if you send Bitcoin to it then and with, with like, like a principle that should then own the Bitcoin, actually the principle that gets that they like the Bitcoin twin on, on ICP. So we, the, the Bitcoin twin is called CKBTC or, or chain key Bitcoin. And now actually with that, you can actually transact Bitcoin also fast on top of ICP, right? So uh, if you would now build a smart contract on ICP that transacts Bitcoin, yes, you can do that. But of course, Bitcoin always takes a, a lot of time to, to settle for transactions. And so it's actually maybe much better if you uh, have this Bitcoin twin on ICP that then actually uh, settles very quickly with like one second finality. And like one of the typical demos I always do is like there's like this open chat application, this chat application where, where people can send this CKBTC to each other, just uh, get people to log in, log in there, uh, send me a message and I send them some Bitcoin back. And they're always very uh, surprised how fast they have received their Bitcoin. Of course, it's this, this Bitcoin twin, but also uh, you can then, uh, you know, uh, have the, this uh, Bitcoin uh, canister also the, then send the Bitcoin twin back to the Bitcoin network, where then it becomes real Bitcoin. So it's, it's like, I mean, some people would think that's like a wrap Bitcoin, but actually it's not a wrap Bitcoin or a bridge Bitcoin because there is no, like no multi-sig or something that controls Bitcoin and then, then somehow control like another ledger. It's really the smart contract that owns Bitcoin and then has this Bitcoin represent, representation that, that, you know, like it, it maintains and then, uh, you know, can send it back. And it actually has like a, an HTTP uh, interface, a URL where people can check how many Bitcoins are currently in that. Uh, in that ledger, how many, like what transactions happen and so on and so forth. It's like a fully transparent, bridgeless uh, way of having Bitcoin of another network. And yeah, I guess here's the, like, you know, normally so here's like uh, WBTC, uh, which is like bridged Bitcoin on, on, on Ethereum. And what happens here is that, yeah, so you have like this, 
group of people, the custodians who hold the Bitcoin and they, they together own the Bitcoin. They sort of interact with some merchants that then like mint uh, uh, WBTC on Ethereum, on Ethereum. But of course, now you have this trusted bridge in, in the middle that controls the Bitcoin the, that, that sort of mints and burns uh, WBTC on Ethereum. So that's like a very bad solution because now you have this bridge you have to, to, to trust, right? Whereas like, uh, what I was just talking about here is actually there's no bridge, there's no tr no trusted third party, but it's really like directly integrated uh, with Bitcoin. Right. So here's some example use cases that they already exist. Um, like there's, there's social fi, DeFi, Ordinal. There's some some enterprise things, and really the action about coding Bitcoin has already started. And so I mentioned that you know like here is uh, Open Chat. OC.app, that's actually the URL that thing has. So that's like a messaging service like, like WhatsApp that fully runs on, uh, on the internet computer. Uh, you know, and, and every chat account actually has like a wallet built in. So you can have uh, Bitcoin or CKBTC, you, you can have uh, ICP, you can have chat tokens and whatnot. And you can send each other these uh, uh, tokens in uh, on top of messages. Really, guess what, what uh, Facebook wants to do with Meta? Uh, but then, uh, or no matter, well, I forget how it was called, but they want to have their, their own coin. But this really does that, right? You, you can send uh, money on chat messages. The next thing is like funded.app. So actually funded, they um, crowdfund, uh, uh, you know, projects on, on the internet computer. And either you can do that with like, uh, with ICP or also like uh, since uh, a few days also, uh, or a few weeks, uh, also with Bitcoin, that's like another thing. And then, so here, what, what you do is you, you uh, get, give Bitcoin or ICP to some project and then they get some NFT. And that NFT uh, typically later on, if, if they do like an SNS or launch their own token, you can exchange that NFT for, for some tokens there. Another example is Discover, where Discover you sort of can tip. Uh, um, so Discover is like, like a uh, Reddit. Uh, um, kind of platform and here you can tip posts in crypto in CKBTC and of course in normal Bitcoin that would not be possible because like transacting Bitcoin is so expensive that you would not want to use that for tipping but here on, on, the, on Discover since uh, CKBTC transactions only cost like a fraction of cents actually now you can tip people in Bitcoin or in CKBTC and if they have collected enough CKBTC then they can uh, you know like like send it out to the Bitcoin network and, and, and redeem uh, their profits. Uh, here is a DEX. It's a full like uh, a full order book exchange that is implemented by a smart contract. Uh, I guess the URL here, here is icdex.io, uh, but then it forwards this, this smart contract URL. You see on, on the top of the browser. So this is like a, a full blown exchange, you can also see you can exchange the CKBTC against the ICP and some, some other pairs. So that already exists, it's very cool. Uh, Fintrust is like a lending uh, platform where also can do lending for, for, for Bitcoin. Bionic, so here that's the bionic.io, so that's the ordinal, ordinal's marketplace. That's just about to, to launch that actually you can buy ordinals in uh, with Bitcoin. And again, this is gonna gonna be like, like a, an autonomous uh, community-owned uh, platform uh, where you can trade ordinals at some point, fully on the internet computer. So there's no uh, cloud parts whatsoever in this solution. Uh, CK Liquidity. That, that's actually we had like a hackathon earlier this year. There's a few projects. These were really more like proof of concept hackathon. So this is like DeFi ordinal and borrow uh, with CKBTC lending protocol for ordinals. Uh, there was P3 wallet, it's like a multi-chain, multi-owner wallet where we can also own uh, uh, Bitcoin and to do stuff with that. Uh, there is a Bitcoin-backed stablecoin. Again, that's a proof of concept, but I guess I know some other people are already working on Bitcoin-backed uh, stablecoins on, on ICP. Oops, there, uh, crossed one. So there, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, there was also the C bank, like a back office where you can make, manage uh, crypto payrolls. It's another hackathon project. Just to give you some ideas, uh, you can also just go to intercomputer.org. Uh, that your URL because it has like an ecosystem, it has a ton of other applications that are built on the internet computer. Some of them do Bitcoin, some of them don't. And really, I mean, the, the nice thing about all of these applications is that these are cool, cool services that they're all 
being done by, by tiny tech teams. Like OpenChat is a, a group of three people. We have Hot or Not, like a TikTok clone. Again, with a group of like four people that, that build the whole application. So that's but because of the power of blockchain, right? You don't have to have a large team. Uh, you don't have to deal with all the security. Like a small team can actually done do great things quite quickly because it sort of can build on top of the, like a secure blockchain network that just has like many of those things top out of the box. And you guys have some, some minutes left. I, I, I alluded to this actually, like uh, smart contracts can also talk to uh, Web2. Uh, Rafa, you have, have a question. Yes, sorry, Jenna. Again, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but the question well, is- do, by all means. <laughs> Yeah, as you as you may have noticed, I'm not your technical guy, so I just want like if how how can I answer my my mother or someone someone who is really not technical at all about you know the security like the security what 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 is it falling onto like what's the weakest link like we, we, you I know you there's been a discussion about it that's the first point and uh, in terms of the second point like in terms of user traction do you have like metrics um uh charts or a place i can look up yeah so i mean for user tracks you, you can look at the, the uh, ecosystem page on intercomputer.org that sort of mentions it's always a little outdated it mentions the user that the, some of these apps have uh, i think like, like uh so the the discover the, the ready clone they have like two hundred thousand users um hot or not just started like this tiktok clone uh, they started like late last year and without any marketing whatsoever, they have like uh, 50,000 users. Open chat is somewhere like 120,000 users. And, you know, these numbers seem like sound small still, but actually, you know, they're constantly growing, right? I mean, they're sort of launched early and then they have users and then they improve the platform to have more users. So it's like, like an organic growth, both on the user side, but also on the platform side, how they extend their platform to handle more users, right? I mean, there's some, uh, there's still, I mean, yes, it's a lot of scaling is automatic, but of course, uh, at the end of the day, you also need to, uh, oops, I want to, at the end of the day, you also, you know, like you, you need to, uh, you know, extend your smart contract to be able to deal with more users, right? So the open chat has like a kind of super user. And then of course, at some point you want, want to like uh, look up users and then you need to cycle as well, all those canisters and then you need to improve all of that. So it, it's like growing. And it can also go, go to dashboard at intercomputer.org. You also see like, like how, uh, you know, like how canisters on like the number of smart contracts on the internet computer grows. And it, it's all like, like going up. So there's the uh, users are, are like more and more users are, are coming and like uh, hot or not, it's probably gonna explode <laughs> very soon because uh, just after they launch their SNS, like so much more content on there, it, it, it changes by, by the day. I mean, we, we're early still, right? I mean, the network is up since two years. And of course, the, the first few months uh, you, you're there, uh, just keep it alive and running. And then, and then uh, applications start building. And then when they have to have a certain stage until the building, they can users and so on. So it's like uh, very early if you compare to like Bitcoin or or, uh, or Ethereum, obviously. But, uh, you know, we see uh, like a great in inflow of users and also sort of people making use of these, these features, right? Like the, what I'm talking about here, Web 2 and Web 3 integrations, all of this, that's pretty unique on the internet computer. And some of these features are also relatively new, right? I mean, the interaction with, with like other web servers, like Web 2 servers, I mean, it's like live since uh, maybe six months, right? And a lot of these are all also enabling uh, things. It's actually pretty impressive on the user side. And also I see the advantage of being very lean having like a, a small group of like feedback loop, like, and then, and then as the complexity, you know, is necessary to grow, then yeah. But, and, and then on, on the tech, like on the tech, on the security, is there like a, a simple mental model that I can share with someone who's not technical to, for them to understand how secure this is? Yeah, so I think this is security here, here is, uh, you know, like, like the, the, the governance network runs on like a 50 node network that are run in, in secure data centers. And you would have to break into to, like to stop the network to do more than one third of them. 
and, and you really like, like uh, modified, you would have to break it into like two thirds of them, like control two thirds of them. But like these nodes are constantly rotated. So, and the keys are reshared like every couple of minutes. So you would have to do that like within a couple of minutes to break it into all of the systems in order to, to get control, right? And I think that that's uh, pretty impossible. And sorry, I'm just, and you know, if, if you compare that to like Ethereum, yes, I mean, you have all, all this, uh, you know, like you have to have like hundreds of nodes because you have no control over where, where those nodes run, who controls them and so on and so forth. So that's why you have to get to these large numbers, right? Uh, but these large numbers actually don't really make sense because uh, it just slow it down. And it's like a false sense of security that, that you get because, uh, you know, like you have to have these large numbers because it's pretty easy. I mean, of course you can stake and so on, but it's actually pretty easy to just spin up like a bunch of nodes and control them, right? And we, we, we I mean, as you, uh, I'm sure you know, like for other networks, like 51 attacks actually happen because sometimes it's pretty easy to do that. And uh, the opposite, if you have like secure, uh, you know, professionally, operated data center, it's actually pretty hard to break in a single one of them, right? Uh, let, let alone it, it, into, into breaking a, into a good bunch of them simultaneously, right? 